started. All right, so after a little rocky start, we're uh, here uh, going to be talking about garlic. Are you ready to talk about garlic, Jordan? I know you are. I know what you've been waiting for this. Um, we are here with our friends from Rooted. Um, I'll have them introduce themselves first. Erica and Hawthorne, please introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Erica Krug. I uh, work at Rooted in Madison, Wisconsin. Thanks for having us. Uh, Hawthorne, there you go. Hi, I'm Hawthorne. I use they, them pronouns. Um, I am the outreach specialist for Farm to ECE at Rooted. And this is Misty. <laughs> nice to have, have our, our friends with us. And uh, Judy, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Jungle Judy Elliott, Senior Education Specialist with Denver Urban Gardens. And for those of you who are just joining us now, when we were having a little challenge, my Great Pyrenees, Ava, did pre-welcome everybody with a squeak. So we're so happy <laughs> you're here. Nothing like a good Ava squeak. All right. Well, uh, we're excited to work together on this, uh, uh, this webinar on garlic. Judy, do you want to start us off with a few uh, You know, I, I was just out today in my garden and I was looking at the earth and I was thinking, isn't it wonderful that I don't know anything and that the earth knows everything? So the earth knows when to green up. It doesn't green up when the temperature is or the day when the temperature is too cold or the daylight hours are too short. It knows how to cover itself with a blanket of grass or mulch to keep the soil nice and loose. Its plants also know how to spread its seeds in the right time, not when we want them to happen. And our, the earth knows best about how to create a thriving environment, not just putting a seed in any place, but it knows how to grow, grow in conditions when it's given everything it, it needs to thrive really well, it will grow in a cycle of flourishing and just nourishment for our souls. So again, I follow the seasons of the earth and I salute its wisdom. And in that wisdom, we are going to celebrate, oddly enough, National Garlic Day on April 19th, which you know is kind of ironic because you plant garlic at a different time than this time of year. But uh, as we were putting this webinar together, we thought, why not? Why not get get everybody ready? This is our this is our community service for you all. Jen has her garlic. She's ready. <laughs> and uh, oh, what a wonderful you know we have made our, our 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 goal here of helping you make National Garlic Day your special day for this year. <laughs> but in this process. Um, uh, we, uh, we learned a lot of interesting things and we have a lot of recipes for you. Uh, Judy has some gardening tips. Uh, Hawthorne has some lovely recipes and, uh, and some interesting things about um, a garlic. Here's our first poll. And I'm gonna launch the first poll here. Which country is the largest producer of garlic according to World Atlas? I have choices here of China, United States, Korea, or Italy. So pick your answer. I'll give you some Game music. I'll give you a couple more seconds. I was surprised by this answer. If you if you must know. Okay, we have a small audience today, but uh, a small but mighty audience. Let me just add. Um, I know some people couldn't come, and they they're waiting for the recording. So I'll end the poll here. We have sort of a spread here. So let's see what our results are. We're going to share the results. Uh, mm, we've got a smattering here. Some people said United States, some people said Korea, some people said Italy. It's actually China. China is by far uh, has um, uh, the most uh, amount of, of garlic produced. Uh, United States doesn't even count in terms of large uh, amounts. We get most of our, our, our garlic from, uh, from California. Korea is the second uh, largest and Italy doesn't even register as well. China has over 20 million, 20 billion. I don't have my notes in front of me, so I can't tell you the actual number, but it's, it's significant. Here's, you know, there are different types of garlic. You may not know this. You may go to the grocery store and say, well, garlic is garlic, right? Well, no, there are, uh, there, there is um, lots of different varieties here. So our next question, let me get our next question. How many different types of garlic are there? How many varieties? 
a uh, little over 100, a little over 200, a little over 400 or 600. What do you think? What do you think? Our answers are coming in. Our answers are coming in. This is a smart group. This is a very well-versed garlic group. I know you are. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll um, and share the results. Uh, this is a little bit of a trick question. If you actually do a little bit of digging around, which I did, some people say there's over 600 varieties, which I was really impressed. But as they're starting to look at different varieties, they're starting to see that there's some duplication in that as they start to do genetic studies and more you know, fine tuned analysis of what types of varieties there are, you actually get all kinds of different numbers. But the, the closest number that people are thinking now based on reducing those is a bit, a little over 200. Judy, I don't know if you have anything you wanna say about that, but I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I do so. I don't know. Um, I think this slide is pretty interesting because you can see one of the varieties of garlic there that has got the beautiful pretty. purple skins, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. And not only there are there tons of varieties with many, many different flavors, but this um, they but they have different they have different uh, growing conditions that we'll talk about. Right. And as a matter of fact, one of the places in the United States that, that's a main variety of growing garlic, which is California, has the Gilroy Garlic Festival. Oh, uh, Gilroy, yes. Gilroy. I've been to Gilroy. Yeah. I actually went to Gilroy one year and I tasted garlic chocolate, <laughs> garlic hot chocolate and garlic brownies. So there's lots of sweet things that are made with garlic in addition to all the savory things. So I think it's pretty interesting the many, many different purposes that garlic has. And when you really get into it, you can really fine tune your palate to a yeah. taste that may be hot or spicy or mild and garlics that keep different different um, lengths of time during the year. So tons of garlic for expanding your taste other than what you can purchase in the supermarket. Like a fine wine, you develop your garlic palate, right? <laughs> uh, over the years. Yeah. Gilroy is great. I've been there. Um, yeah, they have a big sign that says the garlic capital of the right of the I don't know if it's the world, but it's definitely of the US. Okay, now, even though there are hundreds of varieties, you can break garlic into two different categories. And we're going to spend a little bit of time because this is important, if especially if you're going to be planting or also cooking with garlic. So there's two varieties, there's soft neck or hard neck. This time, instead of a pole, take a look at the picture of the garlic in this picture here. What type do you think it is? Type in the chat. Do you think it's hard neck or soft neck? You've got a 50-50 chance of getting it right. Rosa says hard neck. Nuni says hard neck. Jen says hard neck. Elaine, hard neck. What, what's making you say that it's hard neck if you are a, I was gonna ask that. Yeah. yeah, if you are a connoisseur or are you just a, a hedge a better <laughs> that's hedging your bets? So you says soft neck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some some varieties yeah. are hard to tell whether they're hard neck or soft neck just by the outside appearance. And that's why I intentionally did this picture here. Judy, you want to talk about what this is? Yeah, this is hard neck garlic. And we're going to have a couple of slides um, that are going mm -hmm. to discuss the difference. So why don't you, uh, what did, what did, uh, well, let me see. Little, Little Jordan thinks this. they look like garlic pops. You know, oh my goodness. So <laughs> okay. So, so let's learn a little bit about this. Go ahead, we'll Judy. Learn a little bit about this. So hard neck garlic on the right, soft neck garlic on the left. Soft neck garlic is grown in California. It's normally grown, um, it stores longer and it doesn't have that stalk up the center. So it usually has many, many cloves. It usually, and the reason why it stores a lot longer is that it has less moisture in the cloves and the skin that covers them has a really tight covering. So it's got a longer shelf life. And when I'm talking about a longer shelf life, if you purchase garlic, we normally harvest garlic in the early summer. So if you were to grow soft neck garlic and harvest it, let's say in July, you could have garlic that was good for eating for a good five months. Um, it normally is, it's also belongs, sometimes, sometimes people call it artichoke garlic. It kind of looks like an artichoke mm -hmm. when you look at it. So 
more clothes, it stores longer. Uh, you can make garlic braids because it doesn't have that hard neck on it. Um, and if you, buy, if you buy it from the store, a lot of people think, well, I'm just going to save money and plant those garlic cloves. And that doesn't work so well because garlic that you buy in the store has typically been treated with growth inhibitants, which is not a great thing. Growth inhibitant chemicals. So we don't really want to put that in our soil. So those are good for eating. You're going to have smaller cloves. Sometimes they're a little bit harder to, to peel too. And then you can look at the difference and we'll discuss it. You can see that the hard neck with the larger cloves on the right for hard neck, hard neck garlic. And you can see it's cut off stem up on top on the right hand side. So why don't you go to the, uh, so the hard neck garlic, bigger cloves. And if you look at those cloves up, up the middle, you can see a little green piece those cloves are actually beginning to grow. It's pretty interesting. So um, great for roasting. I grow a variety of, of hard neck garlic called Music, M-U-S-I-C, mm -hmm. and I save the cloves every year. So normally um, when I'm choosing a clove, when I'm choosing a garlic like for Denver where we are, I'm choosing a garlic that's going to grow in cold climates. And I love, I just love the hard neck variety. Usually the papery skin around the cloves doesn't cover it as tightly. So it has um, a shorter storage time. Shorter storage time for me means if I harvest it in July, I usually want to eat it by, you know, end of October or November. Versus I'm just finishing the last of my soft neck garlic that I grew right now. Um, I love, love, love to roast my hard neck garlic in the, in the papery skin. It has a wonderful taste. And then you can just actually squeeze that whole thing off on a piece of bread with some olive oil. It makes it wonderful. Yeah, so yum, yum, yum. Always choose a variety for a climate that is grown similar to yours, which is another reason why you don't just want to choose a variety that uh, maybe is good for a southern variety, uh, a southern climate. It's not really going to do well. So um, and we've got this center stock here, right? We got the well. center stock there, and I think we got we got a picture as we go further on that we're going to just discuss what that is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, climate well, taste. Thanks taste for that. Well. I... Yeah. Do we thanks. have a question? Um, I don't know if we have, nope, if we have any questions, type in the chat there or come on the mic there. But uh, in the meantime, we have a lovely recipe, uh, one of my favorite things in the whole wide world. Hawthorne, you want to share with us uh, this, this recipe for pesto? Yes, um, I had such a hard time picking just a uh -huh. couple of recipes. Right. For <laughs> I'm a garlic hound. So yeah, the first one is pesto, which is also one of my favorite things. Um, it's really simple to put together. Um, the base is most often basil leaves, but you can use um, baby spinach or another type of green that you don't mind eating a lot of. Or if you like to remove the invasive plants in your area, you can use garlic mustard as well for an extra garlic mm. flavor. Mm. Unrelated species, but uh, delicious wild invasive, or not wild invasive, invasive plant that we can eat up. Um, and then of course, Parmesan cheese, olive oil, and this recipe calls for pine nuts, but if there's no one with nut allergies in your classroom, you can also replace that with something like walnuts or almonds if you don't have pine nuts. And the original recipe called for three cloves of garlic. I put six cloves here because this is a garlic celebration webinar, but honestly, <laughs> just put as many cloves as your little heart desires. Um, I don't think you can go wrong with a super garlicky pesto. And then just mince all that up in your food processor and I love to toss it with pasta and serve it hot or cold, makes delicious pasta salad, or of course, on a nice rustic loaf. Hawthorne, do you do the ice cube thing where you freeze it? I haven't tried freezing it that way, no, but I see like, yeah. do that a lot, yeah. It works, yeah. I mean, I tend to eat pesto mm -hmm. like all of it <laughs> mm -hmm. instead of saving it, but you know, you can stick it in soups and stuff like that. Delicious, thank it's you. It's wonderful. I've, I've done that the last couple of years, Hawthorne and Rob, um, where I'll just, um, because I make, I grow so much basil, different varieties of basil. I've even done it with a purple, uh, purple uh, basil. 
and you you do the similar type of recipe like Hawthorne is talking about, and you just you spoon it into um, silicone ice cone um, ice cube trays is what yeah. I like to mm -hmm. use. And then once they're frozen, you can put them in freezer sacks, and that allows you to custom made. Hmm, I'll just pop out a couple cubes and put them in soups or put them in in uh, pasta or whatever. But it's what I found is it's a remarkably easy way of um, extending the season and just kind of popping out what you want and getting that taste of summer right back. Mm -hmm. And just to get us in the mood for garlic, uh, Erica, you want to want to showcase this this book over here that we've uh, we came across. Yeah, so we wanted to include a couple of books on the resource and to mention in the webinar. Um, this may not be a huge surprise, but there aren't a ton of children's books out there about <laughs> about garlic. So we did we did some research and um, we found one called the shy garlic. The story is um, it's it's about a garlic who is a little and I think we're going to touch on this a little bit later, but embarrassed about uh, how it how it smells. Um, and so Freddie the garlic is too shy to make friends and uh, covers himself with the scent of a flower so he'll no longer um, smell like garlic and I don't want to give the whole story away but um, it turns yeah. out he's going to have to um, kind of be true to himself in order to help his friends later on in the in the story. So. Yes, indeed. And we have copies of this book. I think it was self-published. I don't know. I think uh, so. Yeah. yeah. But we have uh, some of these books available for our drawing at the end of our session. So you might be a winner of the Shy Garlic <laughs> book. Well, one of the things that um, a, a good sensory activity is uh, in a very simple way, I, you know, um, I honestly haven't tried this yet, but I guess it works really well if you want to peel off, you know, it can be really, you know, tedious and uh, time consuming to take the peel off of, of garlic cloves. So one way you can do it is by sticking it in a, in a metal bowl or a mason jar, uh, shaking it up and magically those peels start to fall off. Well, while you're doing that, certainly the scent of garlic um, starts to permeate as well. So this could be a great uh, a sensory activity that you can do with with kids even you know nicely in a jar I think ideal would be a jar because they can see the garlic and stuff and just see how it how it just uh, uh, peels up there are actually garlic shakers that are expensive that you can order but I, I sort of like this homegrown sort of thing here <laughs> so here's an activity for you um, here's a here's a, a question for you you'll type in the chat garlic has medicinal properties that can aid in lowering blood pressure, true or false? Type in the chat, what do you think? Elaine says true, Noonie says true, Sue says true. Anybody else wanna hazard a guess? Maggie says true, thanks for joining us, Maggie. Thanks for rejoining us actually, see you and Sue and <laughs> Chantal says true. It is actually true. Um, we've known for a long time that, uh, that garlic does have indeed medicinal uh, properties. It can lower blood pressure. Also, I think uh, assist with cholesterol. Oh, my sister has to leave. Uh, you'll have to, yes, we won't, we'll have to, <laughs> have to find out what the end of the garlic story is. Thanks for joining us. You can watch the recording. <laughs> All right. All right, when, here's another poll question. So I'm gonna put this up uh, for you. Let me uh, get my, Thing out of the way here. So we're going to stop sharing the uh, old poll. Um, when do you plant garlic? I launched it winter, spring, summer, or fall. <laughs> I'm not going to sing it for you, but <laughs> I, actually I just did. So you're welcome. Not very well though. So Jen says fall, Chantal says fall. I couldn't stump you all. Uh, well, I stumped a few of you, actually. You would think because of Gar National Garlic Day being in the spring, uh, it, it, you would be in the spring, but actually you plant in the fall, and we're going to learn more about that. Um, you could certainly start to harvest uh, things in the, in the garden in a different season, but we're, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the process of growing. So um, we'll talk about that in just a little bit. 
Jude is going to talk about planting garlic because uh, this is a great thing you can do with kids. Go ahead, Judy. And one of the reasons why it's so great for planting with kids is that the garlic cloves, unlike things like lettuce seeds or um, basil, which is tiny, or carrot seeds, um, the individual cloves, which are really stems, they're not roots, they're stems, um, are are big enough for little hands to, to hold without dropping. So the kids can actually plant those individually. And garlic, when you separate the bulb, it's called the bulb. And when you separate it, you have indiv individual cloves like we use for cooking. And um, one of the things that I like to do is to try and prevent the little ones from removing the papery skin. And I kind of like to say, when you go outside, we're planting this in the fall, the weather gets kind of chilly and we're gonna leave its coat on it to protect it a little bit. So if you're at all, um, if it's possible, leave the skin on and then garlic, you can see it's pointy end coming up and that's the part that you wanna leave up and you wanna plant its flat end, which is the part that has the dried up roots down. And then you're gonna, one of the things that, that I like to do is, is when you're planting garlic, to make sure that you're planting it in full sun, you're only planting your larger cloves. So here's the way that you get a chance to use the whole plant. Because as you remove the cloves, the closer you get towards the middle of the bulb, the smaller the cloves get. So you can actually separate them with the kiddos into larger cloves for planting and smaller ones that then you can do some great recipes with like pesto or something that um, Hawthorne will talk about later on. So we talked about leaving its coat on, leave the paper intact, in, in, in full sun, and then you're going to make sure that the soil that you're planting it in is, has been dug really well and it's got some nice loose compost in it. So pointy side up, flat side down, do plant it a good three inches deep and give it four to five inches apart. Although the cloves look fairly small, you need to leave room for them to expand, which they will do over winter. And it's pretty interesting because I want you to begin to think of the cloves of garlic like a bulb. So just like we would plant crocus or tulips or hyacinth in the fall, the same thing with garlic. And I plant in, in Denver, I plant my garlic around about the first week in October after the soils have cooled down. And we got a couple of pictures that I took in my garden right now of some interesting things. So the picture on the right shows garlic that has been mulched. I always put a layer of straw or dry grass clippings or leaves over it. And the purpose of that is not so much for cold, but is to keep that soil nice and loose. Garlic, like most bulbs, is not deep rooted. It has what we call fibrous roots that look like the mm -hmm. hair of your head. So we wanna prevent that soil from drying out uh, and prevent, keep the moisture in the soil. So you can see, I actually took this picture that I sent to Rob a couple of weeks ago. Garlic is the first plant that starts to sprout. So those are its first leaves coming up. You can see it's got nice, a whole bunch of uh, space in between it. It's doing well. I'm not concerned about getting it, it getting hit by, by, um, by snow or freezing temperature. It's closed down, creeping underground. Its underground stem is going to be just fine. Now, here's a fun thing that you can do on the left. It looks like chives. So um, unbeknownst to me, <laughs> What happened one, one year as I had my grandkids over. Um, right now, Alina is 10 and Eamon is seven, at least the one. So this would have been when Eamon was four and Alina was, was seven. And they were over looking at the garden and the place that is mulched is places that I had dug for the season to come and I had it covered. And then I had my trench in the middle. And evidently when I had harvested garlic the year before, I had left some smaller cloves in that I didn't even realize. If you do not harvest your garlic, like Rob has with a little colored circle around, it will keep multiplying. So this is the first early spring garlic greens. It's not garlic chives. These are garlic that's got tiny little cloves in it. 
And what Eamon said is, Grandma Judy, can I eat those? I said, absolutely. I sent him out with a scissor to chop down the tops of the garlic and it becomes like a gourmet treat that you can put in omelets or stir fries, tastes just like garlic. The garlic plant, those, all those cloves growing together will keep growing until it, it will grow new leaves and it will die down right about the same time that your regular garlic do, does. So what I've started to do is just leave those things in, in the trench. It's hard soil, it's not great soil. And they're so tough and resilient. They come back year after year. And Rob can tell you, I've already shared garlic with him and, and yep. some other friends. And it is absolutely mm. delicious. Uh, it is, you don't, need, don't even need to cook it. You can put it in salad dressings. It's marvelous. So another thing you can do with garlic, it's, it's not a tough plant to grow. Yeah, and um, it has that garlic taste to it too. I mean, it's kind of like having chives, but they're, they taste like yes, garlic. Yes, but it's, it's garlic. Yeah. And, and then when I plant garlic, as you saw with the leaves, the other thing when you're planting it, just like your fall bulbs, you need to water it. So we talked about mulching it, that's covering the soil, blanketing it with several inches of straw or chopped up leaves. And the way I chop up my leaves is I've got the grandkids over and the leaves are dry and they just jump on bags of leaves. They think it's so much fun. We bury it, we bury them in the leaves and then all that chopped up mess we spread on the garden bed. So spread straw over it, spread chopped leaves. I never measure it. And then I water it. And I water it several times during the winter. How do you water garlic during the winter? Uh, we take watering cans out and water it because we want to continue to let those roots to grow, grow how, during the winter. How often do you water in the winter? Do you? Um, I think a rule of thumb is if we don't have adequate snow cover, um, once a month. And I do the same thing with my garden bulbs, like tulips and daffodils. Mm -hmm. If you want to get blooms, you need to do winter watering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks, Judy. And now we have hummus. Yum. Oh Yum. Hawthorne. <laughs> yeah, I think hummus may be at least in my top five favorite foods ever, like period. Mm. Um, and again, I love throwing as much gar garlic as possible in there. Here's, okay, here's my personal pet peeve about hummus. You ever get hummus from the grocery store mm. and you go to look at the nutrition label, you know, as one does, just to see what's, what's going on in there. The serving size, according to that little box, is two tablespoons. Has anyone ever in their life eaten two <laughs> tablespoons of hummus? And said, no, yeah, I think I'm good. I think I'm done now. Two, two no. tablespoons? Two oh tablespoons. To me, a serving size is obviously the little eight ounce container that the garlic came in. But anyway, or not the garlic, the hummus. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, so that's why I like making my hummus at home in my instant pot, which I can make, you know, a good two pounds of chickpeas worth of hummus at a time. Uh, wow. This again is a very, really simple recipe. Um, you don't need an instant pot to make it. You can use canned chickpeas. Those are just as good as the dried chickpeas. If you do dried chickpeas, either you need a pressure cooker to cook them quick, or you want to do the overnight soak to make mm -hmm. sure your beans are nice and soft. And then um, adding in your lemon juice and tahini is the traditional ingredient, which is like a sesame seed paste to make it nice and creamy. But you can use peanut butter, or if there are allergies, you can use sunflower butter, really just any kind of legume butter in there to, to help soft it up. And again, this recipe calls for one garlic clove, um, yeah. that's a travesty. You gotta just throw <laughs> a whole bulb of garlic in there. It's, it, you need Absolutely. it to burn your face. It's not good hummus if it doesn't like make your nose run a little bit. Um, <laughs> and then of course your lovely spices like cumin and I love uh, a whole bunch of paprika in mine as well. And this recipe calls for a little bit of the aquafaba, which is the water that your beans have been soaking in either in the can or oh. over that overnight soak. And that helps to thicken it up a little bit. And again, just combine all that stuff in your food processor and whip it until it's as chunky, as smooth and or as you want it. And this of course is great for veggie sticks or on crackers, or if you're working with little ones, I absolutely love these veggie faces. It's a great way to get mm. kids to try small amounts of new vegetables and get a little bit creative um, and get more excited about, about eating their veggies and hummus. Yeah, I think that's really, you, you hit on something, Hawthorne. You know, it's just, 
it, it helps just to make it easier to make it more palatable to have mm -hmm. vegetables if you've got something as tasty as hummus. I think that's a really good point. Mm -hmm. and, and hawthorn chickpeas are called something else, are they not? Yeah, or garbanzo beans. Mm -hmm. garbanzo beans right. yeah i love this recipe because yeah you can just get a can of it and uh uh at the grocery store and it's you know this is a pretty straightforward recipe that kids can participate in and and before well, rob would you go back for just a moment to, to the slide um one thing i have to share you know hawthorne was so nice to share that wonderful pesto and now hummus recipe so when my my daughter um Erica was, was married, and this was in Florida. She requested that I make all this homemade bread, which I did and shipped down, but she said, mom, can you also ship down hummus and pesto? So <laughs> that, was, that went down to some weddings. So who knows what generational type of wisdom you're going to start spreading around. Um, if you go ahead and share that. I absolutely love those. Um, That's a nice I also, thought. <laughs> also love the idea of doing veggie faces with kids. With <laughs> I advocate for veggie faces, yes. I, just, I, I do as well. Advocate. We are very yeah. strong advocates for veggie faces. <laughs> and and, and uh, garlic can be used for pest control. Do you oh want to talk So for many of you who have grown gardens, it seems to just suddenly emerge from beautiful green, pristine leaves to, oh my goodness, what is on my plant? And it's somehow, and I almost don't have any leaves left. So what you're seeing on the top left is colonies and colonies of the, the many, many different types of aphids. You never just see one aphid. You see hundreds of aphids and they come in many different colors and they transmit viruses. And they're really good parents because a lot of aphids and a lot of insects are on the underneath sides of leaves where it's cooler. So we got aphids doing all this disease stuff and making it, oh, yak, what's that, mom? And then the next thing you know, the kids are in the garden and they brush up against your lovely cabbage or broccoli leaves that now have these absolutely disgusting caterpillars from the white cabbage butterfly on or the imported cabbage butterfly. And they seem to grow within a week, they do from an egg to a really, really small caterpillar to something that looks like this to then making huge holes. So you have a yuck and you say, aren't I lucky? I have garlic growing because that strong smell that we get when we eat garlic, insects are really sensitive to the smells that different herbs and plants put out. So as you can see, you can just, and it says two to four garlic cloves. I would just throw garlic cloves in. I've also, thrown, mm. I've also thrown an onion in. You can throw whatever type of hot peppers you've got in, jalapenos, serranos. I've used habaneros, cayennes. You'd leave the seeds in some olive oil and dish soap to make it, the solution stick to the leaves. If you have some leaves of rosemary or oregano, I would pull them off. So again, the strong smelling stuff, you don't really need hot water, but my, usually what I do when I'm making this, this concoction is I will do a half a blender full of herbs and you know half a, a blender full of ingredients and then a half a blender full of water and I'll blenderize it and I'll leave it overnight to kind of concentrate. And then I'll strain it out. And one of the ways that you can strain it out is you can use a coffee filter with, you know, over a tin can or something so that you're keeping your solids out. And then you can actually dilute that spray, that wonderfully strong smelling spray. I would um, definitely use something to, to keep your nose and your eyes away from that. Remember mm -hmm. that you have hot peppers in there, but you can then dilute that spray down quite a bit until it looks like kind of a weak chamomile tea. You can spray that on your leaves. It's not gonna kill the caterpillar and the aphids. Remember if you've got aphids, you're gonna need wherever those insects are that you want to control, you need to directly hit them. So do turn over the leaves get your caterpillars and it kind of lets the insects know, no, uh, I, I need to move away. And again, they're responding to those strong sulfur compounds. So if you throw onions in, 
that'll help too. And then, you know, you might wonder, do I need to throw away all that mash? No, then you can distribute those goodies at the bottom of your plants and just kind of, you know, put them under a little mulch pile of a little mulch of straw or leaves that you might still have in the garden. And that will help with additional pest control. So I always, always use this hot pepper garlic spray um, as a repellent. And I found that it works pretty well. That's great. And I love Hawthorne's commentary on this. <laughs> what did Hawthorne say? Just, uh, just extra commentary. Uh, we've got 15 minutes. So let's, oh, no. uh, let's uh, move into uh, some other things about garlic. Um, which way, this is just in the chat, which way do you prefer eating garlic? You probably, as if you're like me, it's like, it doesn't matter, you know, just, just give me the garlic. <laughs> but if you have a preference, let us know. Oh, Erica and Hawthorne are, are they're hardcore. Yeah, raw. I had this, great, while people are putting in their responses, I had this really simple recipe. I'll stick it in the, in the, um, in the resources. Um, uh, garlic knots, just pizza dough that you just slice into knots, uh, Parmesan garlic, uh, a, you know, a ton of garlic, of course, and some seasonings and uh, just toss it. Oh, it's so good. So, so, so uh. good. Now, here's some things I learned um, as, and you can see what, how people prefer their, their, their garlic. We have uh, a whole variety of, of choices here. Garlic breath. Um, the sulfur compounds um, in the garlic uh, react in your mouth and uh, cause that uh, bad breath. And uh, we know that brushing your teeth can help or drinking water with lemon juice. Judy, do you have anything else you wanna say about this or? The only thing I wanna say is, you know, this is not garlic, but we know that onion has got similar type compounds in it. Yes, yeah, thank you. So in the stores, that. sometimes they, you, you'll see sweet onions and sweet onions don't store very well. They're, they're grown in Georgia or Texas. And the reason they're sweet is the soils that they're grown in have got less sulfur in them. So, you, I mean, they don't grow really well here. They're what we call a short day onion, but they have less sulfur in them. So um, pretty interesting on that, so. A short day onion. That, yeah. <laughs> I know some people that are short day onions, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, garlic hands, if you have garlic on your hands, uh, Hawthorne brought this up and I, I was intrigued by this. So I looked into yeah. this a little bit more. And if you rub your hands on stainless steel, you can actually remove that smell. And so uh, this is an activity you can do with kids, the garlic smell experiment. And I found this lovely video, um, and again, I'll, it's on YouTube, but basically they had this experiment, you know, try it with a stainless steel spoon and try it with a plastic spoon. And um, you rub your hands, you put some garlic, you cut some garlic, you rub it on both your hands, you wash one hand. And as you can see what he's doing here, he's just, rubbing the spoon, the stainless steel spoon, as he's rinsing the water. The water actually activates the garlic and, and changes, changes the chemical, uh, uh, the, you know, the, it causes a chemical reaction with the garlic. And then the sulfur compounds actually adhere to the, to the stainless steel, the chromium in particular. And, uh, but you can try it with a plastic spoon and, and uh, see, and compare so that I wash one hand with the stainless steel spoon and I wash the other one with a plastic spoon and then have kids smell, do a smell test. Does one have That's less of a smell than mm -hmm. the other? I think it's just a fun sort of thing. Uh, not that you would necessarily get into the chemistry of it, but just to, you know, as a sensory uh, activity, I just thought it was very fun. They do go in a little bit of detail of how this happens and, and why, not, not to the full like biochemistry level, but I just thought it was interesting. And apparently the verdict is not completely in about whether this is true or not, but it, it's enough that, um, you know, you can notice a difference. So uh -huh. very fun. Erica, we've got, uh, uh, speaking of fun, we've got our Grow Your, Your Own Ingredients Pasta Sauce book. Go ahead. This is another book that we wanted to highlight. Um, this is a neat book that goes through, um, first it goes through the ingredients in pasta sauce and, and um, gives directions for how to grow them. So it has directions for growing peppers and tomatoes and onions. And then also it talks about garlic here. So it has a really nice um, 
pictures, I think, and, and talks about how to, to plant and harvest your garlic. Um, and then at the end of the book, it goes through um, and has a, a recipe for creating um, your pasta sauce. Yeah, simple, Another straightforward pasta sauce, yeah. really. Yeah, yeah, very healthy one. Yeah. And I am so hungry, by the way. I'm just <laughs> having to put that <laughs> I <up> know, <laughs> I know, right? Oh. <laughs> yeah. It's very true, it's very, very true. Um, uh, we have a short little video here on uh, garlic scapes. You want to, Judy, you want to talk briefly about what garlic scapes are? Yeah, so it looks like a monster, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. um, garlic scapes are the unopened flowers um, as the, that come from hardneck garlic. So remember the hardneck garlic stores less, less of a storage than, than the softneck garlic. So as the days get longer, the plant responds to the lengthening daylight hours by saying, it's time for me to flower. So in late spring, as summer is approaching, it will send up these long stalks that sometimes will curl. And that's when you want to harvest it before the stalks get really, really thick. Are you going to play that? Yeah, we're going to uh, play it here. Yeah, uh, let's just go the, ahead and the, play it. The important thing is you can actually eat them. And so what Brittany, my, my colleague, is, is doing, here is the garlic. You could see the leaves are turning yellow and she's just taking her finger or a scissor. She's going to pinch it off or cut it off where it emerges from the leaf down at the base before that actually opens. Because the, the more, because the younger, uh, the sooner that she does that, the more that the energy is gonna be given to letting that bulb enlarge a little bit. And then you can just chop that up and use it the same way Hawthorne would say, go ahead and, and use garlic and pesto. You can make garlic scape mm -hmm. pesto. Mm -hmm. If you were to go to a gourmet store like Whole Foods, they sell garlic scapes in late spring and they're super expensive. So this might be a project you wanna do with your kids and invite the parents in and make garlic yeah. scape recipes. And just to point out, these are different from what we talked about earlier. Those were leaves as opposed to the scapes. These are the leaves, right. Right. So. Okay, right. Let me, oh, Britt's going to go again. Harvesting garlic. Hawthorne, back to you. Hello, hello. Yeah, so um, in our area, and I think it may be similar in Colorado, your garlic is usually going to be ready around July or August. Uh, sometimes depends on when you planted it in winter and how your season has gone. And you want to look at the bottom leaves. Once they have reached, once your bulbs have you know, gotten close to maturity, they're going to start having their leaves die off. But you don't want to wait until the entire plant is yellow. By then your bulbs might be overgrown or start getting a little soft on you. So you want to look for the bottom one third or one half of the leaves to be yellow and drying out. And then loosen the soil around the bulbs with a shovel or a fork. I harvest my potatoes in a similar way. You want to be like six to eight inches away from your garlic when you stick that shovel in the ground so you don't cut your bulb. Um, and then just give it a nice crank with your shovel to loosen that soil on both sides. And then I like to just get in there with my hands and pull them out. You don't want to yank on this stalk itself because you can pull the stalk off the bulb and then you'll have an open wound where your garlic can get moldy or something like that. Mm -hmm. Just gently remove it from the soil and then brush off some of that dirt. It's okay if you leave a little bit of dirt on while they're drying. And then next slide. So you can eat your garlic fresh out of the garden. It's going to be extra spicy that way. But if you want it to store a little bit longer, you'll want to cure it. And that just means just like onions or potatoes, you leave them in a dry, well-ventilated space without direct sunlight. Uh, I know most farmers will just sort of cover up part of their um, hoop house or their greenhouse and lay it in there or an old barn works great too, or just a back porch. And then let those dry out for about two weeks. For hardneck, I take my um, pruning shears and just clip off the stems about two inches away from the bulb you wanna have a little bit of that stem left so you're not damaging your bulb. For soft neck, you can trim them or you can put them in these beautiful garlic braids and hang them up by those to store. And then like Judy said, the hard neck varieties you wanna eat up probably by the end of November. I made the mistake of uh, waiting a bit too long and mine got what well, nicely aged. Um, <laughs> I still managed to make <laughs> garlic powder out of them. They get a little spicy on me, 
Uh, otherwise, if you have a root cellar, you can maybe stretch that out a little bit longer, but the soft neck varieties will store much better. And then of course, garlic can be dried and powdered. It can be pickled, it can be roasted or frozen in olive oil, like Rob was saying, um, for longer preservation. Now, yeah. on, before, before we go on to the next slide, um, people might be wondering why we don't wash our garlic. Why don't we wash the soil off when you harvest it? Oh yeah, good point. Because you don't want to introduce any more moisture onto that clove that will encourage mm. mold growing. And a lot of gardeners also recommend to stop watering one to two weeks before you plan on harvesting. If you can prevent it, sometimes the rain will get to us. Um, but letting those bulbs dry out as much as you can will help extend their shelf life. Mm -hmm. Nice. Thank you so much. And we're gonna, we actually have a pickled recipe in just a minute. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. Before we get there, uh, we've got a poll here. This is our um, next to last poll. So um, what is the Guinness Book World of Records for the most garlic cloves eaten? Uh, is it 26, 36, 46, or 56 cloves? And uh, boy, bless Whoa. the person that actually did this because I don't know if I could do it. <laughs> All right. Uh, our results, we've got a split. Uh, uh, well, well, actually more people, I'm going to share the results. People think it might be the 36 or 46. If you said 36, you were correct. Oh, 36 okay. cloves. And this was just recently, um, not just a few years ago. So, <laughs> so there's a record to be broken as well, I'm saying. So there we go. Uh, Hawthorne, here is our, our amazing Korean pickled garlic. Oh, you want to talk about that? There. Yeah, I was very excited to find this recipe. I am not a Korean speaker, so I will not butcher the Korean name of it. Um, <laughs> but this is a common side dish or banchan that's served with um, basically Korean food, you know, either hot pot or stir fry, whatever you're making, barbecue, um, served on a big table, uh, family style, and then you've got a lot of little side dishes that you can add to your plate to flavor it. So this is a really common side dish for that. And this is a hot vinegar pickle. And mm. when you're, if you're familiar with fermentation, um, garlic is not an ideal plant to do lacto fermentation with. If you wanna do that, you would want to mix it with other vegetables that are gonna have more of that good bacteria on their surface, like green beans or peppers or something like that to make dilly beans or to make a hot sauce. Um, so this one uses hot vinegar mm -hmm. and uh, it will seal itself. Once you pour that boiling vinegar over your garlic, you're gonna add um, a cup of water, a cup of sugar and a cup of soy sauce. If you have any soy allergies in your class, you can use coconut aminos for a soy-free recipe. Mm -hmm. uh, boil that up and then add in your vinegar after you turn off the heat because you don't want to cook off your vinegar. And then pour that over the uh, garlic that you've packed into your mason jars and screw on the lids really quick and you'll hear those lids click because the hot water will help seal it. And then of course it's full of sugar and vinegar so it will be um, pretty well preserved. And you want to leave those at room temperature for at least two weeks in a dark space uh, to let that vinegar really soak in. And sometimes the garlic will actually turn blue. I think that is a reaction mm. with the vinegar and some of the sulfur compounds in the garlic, but that is a perfectly healthy color for your pickled garlic to be. And then once you open your jars, you can transfer them to a refrigerator. Otherwise they should keep for three to four months at least. Although I tend to push the USDA recommendations on my pickled things. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this is great. We have to have you for a cooking show, Hawthorne. <laughs> yeah, this is a very fun one. Uh, I, I'm, I'm anxious to try this out this is, um, with noodles. Oh, my God, please. <laughs> you know, Rob, I, I have to say, um, Hawthorne said use as a side dish. I, I would be hard pressed to not just put a spoon in the jar. And I know, I know. It's, it's great. Delicious. Yeah. Well, we're out of time. I do want to uh, mention this one. I found this on Pinterest. I think it's just a very, you know, I mean, you have to be sensitive about using food in, in activities with young kids. Um, but um, using the, you know, the, the, the peels of uh, the paper of the, of, the, of the cloves and peeling them back into flowers, 
You could certainly braid these, you know, using them garlic braids and everything like that. Very simple activity. I mean, basically you're just peeling back to make it look like flowers, but a nice way to celebrate National Garlic Day, which again is April 19th. So, um, and you would, you know, be at a loss if you didn't have resources here for you. Um, I'm gonna pass this over to Hawthorne since uh, you've done so much great work in, in um, putting these together. Do you wanna talk a little bit about it? Sure, I mean, this was a, a very collaborative resource creation. Indeed, so big yes. shout out to uh, Paula and Laura from the Doug team and Rob and Judy and my coworker Erica. But yeah, we've got this little garlic one pager. Um, it's two pages, but you can print front to back for a nice handout. Great to give out to parents if you are doing garlic activities at your site. We've got the books recommended here, as well as the activities and recipes that we've mentioned um, as well. And we have a, a original garlic song that may be more of a fun chant um, since we didn't rhyme it very well, but I think it's adorable and perfect. And that is available in both English and Spanish. If we send out the slides afterward, these are live links. Otherwise, you can find these on our website at Rooted if you go to Early Care and uh, Educator Resources. Yes, and we will indeed send these slides out to you all. And do check out these resources and the other resources on the Rooted page uh, web website. Um, they just have a lot of great stuff uh, that they have both created and curated, um, just done a really lovely job with that. And so that leaves us to our final poll. Um, we have done a lot of different activities or, or highlighted, let's say, a lot of activities. Which ones are you most likely to choose? And um, I will launch the poll. Um, and uh, just to get a sense of which ones you're most interested in. So um, go ahead and choose. Uh, I, I've given you a chance to choose as many as you want. The results are coming in. And I'll just give you a little bit, a little bit more time. Um, I, we had so many different, different activities here and recipes. Um, we'll see what people are mostly interested in. Oh, very nice. Well, on the higher end is the garlic one pager. So our efforts have been, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, validated, I guess is the word to say. So let me share the results with everybody. People are interested in the garlic shaker, the shy garlic book. Um, let's see the one pager. Uh, but, you know, people highlighted a number of these things and, you know, no matter, we'll make these available to you. Um, we're, uh, we're at time and I want to respect everybody's time. So we're going to have a drawing for the Grow Your Own Ingredients Pasta Sauce. I am thinking of a number. You're going to have to go and type in the chat and the first one that gets it. Okay, so be ready on the chat. I'm thinking of a number from uh, one to 10. Who's got my number? Elaine says seven. Rosa says two. Chantal says seven. Da, da, da. Rosa, you are you you are the lucky. You you got the book last time, uh, number two. So Rosa gets the grow your own pasta ingredients. Okay, shy garlic. I have. I'm guessing a number between ten and twenty. And let's see who gets it. Type in the chat. Nune, you get it. Seventeen. So you get the shy garlic. So Rosa and Nune, you are our winners for today. Um, that is my my uh my very clever way of getting getting a, a drawing out there um but um thank you everybody i just really appreciate your time uh, we'll make this available and and special thanks to our friends at rooted uh yes. erica and hawthorne lovely to have you lovely to have all of your support uh we we hope to continue to work with you in some Absolutely. fashion such fun so, and judy as always thank you so much always fun to work oh, with I you want to thank everybody so for being here yeah what a lovely time we've had so thank you for your time enjoy the spring enjoy national garlic day yeah oh. you're, you're so now well prepared you can have a party you can read oh books my goodness. you can do chants what more do you need you're you're set <laughs> <laughs> any final words erica hawthorne no this was just so fun thank you so much all right hawthorne. we love it thank you all <laughs> thank you guys okay all thanks right. everybody have a, have a good night